fabulous. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's a really, really broad range of topics to talk about leading through change uh, and understand where we're going in terms of change. You know, how do you um, overcome some of the obstacles through that? And also, how do you create and lead teams that can thrive through change? So I'm going to just kind of touch the surface of each of those topics and then leave a really good amount of time for questions. And that's because I believe actually the power is not in me standing here talking at you, it's in the conversation that we're going to be able to have and the questions that you have at the end. So I really, really hope um, that I stimulate some questions on the way through and we can have a really good discussion. And if I haven't covered stuff, then do feel free to ask me uh, in terms of questions at the end because there's a lot of information that I haven't covered in this. I thought I'd just start by talking about me. So, uh, and a little bit about my backstory so you can kind of understand where I'm coming from for the rest of the presentation tonight. So I was born Matthew number three. So I was the third child, everything was sold, so I was completely a mistake. And my parents wanted a boy. Uh, and that's cool, they wanted, um, in, you know, because I was Matthew number three, so they had tried before, so I didn't feel alone on that. Um, and why do I say that? Because actually your circumstances shape you and I was going to talk a bit about that throughout tonight. And so I was brought up to do everything. So we chainsawed, chopped trees, painted fences, I mowed the lawns, um, which actually I did find the more interesting bits rather than the ironing and polishing the silver. Um, but the point is that I could do it all and so in my mind that task split between men and women, you know, male, female, just kind of didn't really exist for me growing up. And that's been really important uh, in my career, particularly being in a more male-dominated uh, tech and innovation industry. So that was kind of the, the start. I guess the other thing that's important about, you know, how my childhood shaped me, we have no claim to fame in our lineage. My mum's been doing genealogy for about two decades now, got back to about 1400. The only claim to fame I have is that I'm like Mick Jagger's eighth cousin. Like, that's it. <laughs> so we didn't come from a lot of money, we didn't come from a lot of lineage, uh, and my parents both grew up um, in state houses. My dad never owned his house. Um, my grandparents with my mum, they bought their house after coming out of a state house. But what my parents taught me was the value of learning and the value of teamwork. And again, that's something that I've carried right throughout my career, uh, and we'll talk about the value of learning as we go through. Kind of, I headed into university, because there was no option for me not to go to university, coming from um, the family that I came from, and I just, I didn't really have any idea what to do, so my dad was a businessman, so I picked that. I was like, yep, let's do business, this looks interesting. I was also really, really good at music, but I knew I wasn't good enough to be a, you know, a world-class classical performance pianist and I knew that I probably wouldn't earn much money in that. So I chased business. Um, I did my degree, uh, BCA, I kind of didn't know what to do. I did my honours, not that well to be fair. And then I went into my masters, um, but all through uni I actually worked as well. I cleaned houses, I waitressed. So I had this you know, um, really interesting time of getting some work experience and learning. Then I finally realised I had enough, went into the workforce and landed in telecom. That kind of started the next phase of my career. So my dad was my role model. So he went in as the postman at his company and he came out as the managing director. And so that was my life through telecom for about 18 years, was I went in as an analyst. Uh, and I got to the executive um, with telecom splitting in terms of went into chorus. And then I kind of thought, do you know what, the world's changing and this whole thing of being with one company for life, that's all gone. So there was no way that I wanted to continue that journey. So um, as someone said to me, when, they, when you're offered a seat on the rocket ship, you don't actually ask how much, you know, and you don't dictate the conditions, you just go. And so I jumped into zero. Uh, and that's a bit about my life, I guess, is that I've always just jumped in without thinking about it too much. It started when I was two, I jumped into the deep end of the pool. Clearly I didn't know how to swim when I was two. I just jumped in and, um, and I worked out how to make it work. And it was the same with the Meralty, and I'll talk not much about the Meralty tonight, but a little bit in terms of why I went for that. Like if I had thought deeply about that, there's no way in hell <laughs> I would have done that. And I've actually got Elaine who's here tonight from my campaign team, who was just, where is she? She was amazing throughout the whole thing. Um, so the value of having an incredible support team around you. Um, I would never have done it. But in hindsight, it was the most amazing, incredible, 
most expensive my self-paid personal development course. Um, <laughs> but as, you know, as people would say to me, do you feel like you failed? And I go, do you know failure would be never trying that? And that's how we need to think as a country, is it's not about failure, it's about not trying. So we'll talk a bit more about that as well. So um, the, the final thing I just wanted to share about my story is that I remember very early on in my 20s, um, so I'm 44 now, um, and I just tell you that because everyone knows my age from the mayoralty, so I'm 44. Um, so in my early 20s, um, a CEO said to me, you know, Victoria, you'll never have a family and be a CEO. And I was like, oh, that's really sad. <laughs> like, that's so sad. Why do I have to pick a career and, a, you know, an ambitious um, an ambition over a family? And I was like, nah, this is not okay. I'm going to be really successful and I'm going to have a family. So this is my beautiful family. So I am now a CEO and I have a family and I'm a woman. And it's about actually saying, no, that's, that may have been applicable 20 years ago, but I'm gonna chart a path that works for me and for my family about how I'm going to balance you know, my ambitions in life and my family in life. And I'm really personally quite proud of not um, of how I've been able to navigate through that um, while staying true to my fam family values and my kids. So a big, big part of what's going to come through in my, my talk with you tonight is nothing great is achieved in your comfort zone. I have never achieved my best work in my comfort zone. The best work that I have ever achieved has been when I've shoved myself out of it, literally running, jumping and leaping. So starting with the pool uh, in telecom, I went into the retail sales area, um, running all of retail sales for now Spark. I'd never run a sales channel in my life. But that was one of the most successful jobs that I did, and we'll talk a little bit about um, the elements of building teams and how that creates that success for you. For the mayoralty, I didn't, I didn't win, but I actually got 110,000 votes, and I'm really proud of that, and I learned so much, and it's created a whole new way for me to think about my job, my life, how I work with my customers. Um, it's, it's unbelievable. So getting yourself out of your comfort zone, we'll come back to that a few times. So the first thing I'm going to go through um, is leading for change. And I think the first thing that is really important in leading for change is that you understand it. So this is just a bit of a timeline of the major changes that we've been through, starting with the um, Industrial Revolution uh, over the past, um, the first and second, through the 18th century and the 20th century. Uh, and then, of course, we've been going through the, um, actually, that third one, sorry, that should say Internet Revolution. Um, so that's very much around how the PC came in and the internet came in and, and everything that we've been going through over the last 40 to 50 years. Uh, and we're just starting to enter the industrial internet revolution. So that is where um, uh, matter, so that's people, um, that's animals, that's aeroplanes, that's cars, anything like that, meets um, the internet and things like sensors. And so that is going to completely change the world that we're going into. So why, why is this important and why have I raised this? Because we as individuals are shaped by our experiences and there's people in this room of all different ages, which is fabulous. I was kind of born um, in the 70s. So that's like, you know, computers went around. I had like the TV um, and, you know, the Walkman and stuff. But, but, but how I was brought up, was completely different on how my children are and completely different on how my parents are. And so uh, another big theme that will come through today, today is the value of emotional intelligence. So being able to understand someone else's experience uh, is really important. And one of the things that frustrated me around the mayoralty and the housing debate is how we're slagging each other off. So the older generation are slagging the younger generation off for having too much avocado on toast. And the younger generation are slagging the older generation off for sitting on assets. And I break that down and I say, that's just rubbish, actually. Because my parents, which is the older generation, they grew up in the depression coming off the back of that. So they, scarcity was huge for them. That was ingrained in them from their childhood. And so they see me eating avocado on toast and they question that. And I understand why they question that. Um, and the other way around, I look at my parents and many of their friends and they've worked so hard their whole lives um, to get where they've got and to get their house and it's just flipping luck, actually, that the housing market's gone up like it is. And so I'm really interested in how do we create conversations that bridge the generations, not divide them. And I think understanding people's experiences and when they've come from is so important to do that. You can't judge a 70-year-old 
based on your experience as an 18 year old and, and vice versa the other way around. So for me, having spoken to groups of all ages from kids through schools right to probus, the most challenging talk I ever gave was to probus and that was the value of um, and trying to help them understand what cloud technology was. That was, I was exhausted and needed about three wines after I came out of that. <laughs> but the great thing was, using this model, they got through it and they could start to see it. So I think for me, you know, the important thing around this is, this shapes our experience um, and it's really important to understand it. Why is it important? Because it's about to, like our world is about to change significantly and I'm really, part of why I've come to Callaghan is to help educate New Zealanders to that. When you look at the latest um, MYOB report, 44% um, of businesses, the biggest technology that's going to shape their business over the next decade, does anyone know what they think it is? And you're not allowed to answer Rosalie because you probably know, Rosalie's at course. Better broadband connectivity. You go, right, okay, so that's kind of where we've been in the last decade. Um, things like big data, drones, artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, 4D printing, um, a whole new way of thinking about you know, genetic engineering, all of that. That's what's going to shape the next decade of your business. But we've, quite frankly, as a country, got our heads in the sand around that. So this is important for me because what we have experienced um, in, you know, you look at our, you know, my mum and dad and what they've experienced and what's going to go through just completely, it's going to blow their mind completely. For those who are coming out of university, you've grown up in the age of the internet mobility and all of that, you, you, you'll be able to navigate this a bit quicker than the rest of us. But this is an exponential shift in what we are going to be able to do. And why is that? Because our computing power is doubling every 12 to 18 months. So when we think about life 40 years out, that's about 5 million times, uh, actually it's not, it's 40 million times, I think, the computing power that we have today. So who can actually imagine what are we going to be able to do with that? So for me, um, a big part of it is trying to educate people as to what the heck does this mean? So when you say, what? <laughs> I miss that. <laughs> When you say, what is life going to look like in 2050? Like, I actually don't think any of us know. Like, I really don't think anyone knows. So, um, let's talk a little bit about what does some of this mean. This is a little bit hard to see, so let me just share some of it with you. So, in 2014, cell phones have more processing power than the computers that put the man on the moon. So, that's, you know, how far we've come in that. Uh, 2021, the iPhone 7 technology can fit in a blood cell. So that's how quickly we are moving. So you think about how we can fit that level of computing power inside, inside our bodies. And this is what the likes of Orion are working on now, is chips that sit inside your body and they um, every day, uh, well every minute of every day, are sharing the information that is coming out of your body with actually whoever you want to share it with. Um, 2026, the ability to put man on Mars. 2033, the ability to reverse age. I reckon I might just make that. Um, and, and um, you know, uh, in terms of possibilities, who knows when in terms of actually being able to completely mimic who we are. Now, I'm not going to stand here and talk about all the ethics of all of this. What I'm doing is raising this curve with people to say, we need to start talking about it. You need to start thinking about it in terms of what it means for your life, your career, and we'll cover some of that. We need to start talking about it as businesses in terms of where is this going to take our business because it's guaranteed that the businesses that understand this will create global opportunities out of this. And the rest of us who don't get it will be lucky to survive the next two decades. It creates huge, huge issues for our ethics and morals. So when you're in a driverless car situation and you're facing a deer and a human or you're facing two humans and you're going to hit one, which one does the car hit? Uh, and, it and it provides massive regulatory challenges for us. Like we can't even regulate uh, in terms of New Zealand government for existing technologies, let alone the curve looking like that. Um, so that's why I'm raising it, is not because I have the answers. We have the answers as New Zealand, um, as, as groups of people here, as industries, as businesses, as people passionate about it. So what are the sorts of things that we're going to be able to create, of it, create out of it? And I've just covered just a, um, a few of them. So for me, why did I go into the mayoralty? Because it is a bit left field, to be fair. It's a bit weird. Um, is actually because I, in zero, I looked, at, I looked after 180 countries around the world. 
And it was, and they weren't the biggest country, so UK, US and UK had separate country managers, I had everything else. Um, it was unbelievable to see on the world stage how cities were investing in the next generation of cities, so smart cities. And then I looked at Auckland and just go, where is it? Where is the smart city here? At that stage, India had announced 19, 19 smart cities. They're investing about a billion in each city at least. They're now up to 100 smart cities. We are completely at risk of being annihilated by developing countries who get this stuff. They are passionate for education. They have an attitude that the developed world don't, don't have. And they have technology in the new world and new business models that they don't need to worry about the old stuff that we have. So I look at, looked at that and just went, we've got to get Auckland on the map, on the path towards smart cities. And what we can do when we integrate sensors into our water systems, sensors into our environment, sensors into our traffic, we keep building this, these traffic lanes that are completely underutilised. If, if you're in a business, that is the worst utilisation of your business assets and resources, is to have something empty for 95% of the day. So how do you use sensors to feed real-time information to shift traffic around in a smart way? That's what's happening globally, and so I'm passionate about how do we get that happening here. Another one is autonomous vehicles, and when I first um, launched the campaign, man, did I get my head chopped off for talking about driverless vehicles. By the end of the campaign, I talked to, I don't know, 10, 15,000 people about it, and people started to get it. And, and so what's the benefit of that? It's the 90,000 death, uh, 90, injuries every year around the planet that are predominantly caused by human behaviour. So you imagine if we can reduce some of that. It's the likes of my parents who are getting, you know, not yet, but five, six years away from not being able to drive. They can keep their mobility. It's the likes of people who don't have sight who suddenly have a range of mobility available. These are the conversations we need to be having, not looking at driverless vehicles from a technology perspective, but how do we apply them into our society? Uh, and the next one is food 2.0. So thinking about some of the thoughts of, thoughts of the things here. Um, last week I went up to um, Stamford with the Tohono Group, which is the ag agriculture group for New Zealand, uh, trying to shift our entire industry from high volume to value. Two-thirds of that, the people in their, that room have their heads in the sand around what is going to happen to our industry in the next five to ten years. So Impossible Foods, who's heard of Impossible Foods? Yeah, so let's do a wee little thing. Who would eat a plant-based burger? Hands up. Exactly. Very progressive audience we have here. <laughs> <laughs> you could have heard a nail drop in the, the kind of just um, what's the word, the distrust from the room of the impossible food scientist was unbelievable. That is going to come and shake our beef and lamb industry in a way that we, and chicken, in a way that we just don't, we are not understanding. It's the same with synthetic milks, which will come in and attack our dairy industry. So it's not whether this stuff will happen, it's going to happen. And it's whether we have the ability to, one, be open-minded to see it, and two, to transition our industries to survive it. Uh, there is, of course, the ability to thrive, um, and we can talk a little bit about that as we go through. So that's some of it. Um, the biggest thing for me in all of this is, as individuals and as businesses, as universities, you need to disrupt yourself. When you disrupt yourself, you have a much better chance at controlling the rules of the game. When someone else comes in and does it, you don't get a say in what the rules of that game looks like, either as a person or either as a business. So this is just, there's plenty, plenty of examples of curves and models in terms of how you disrupt yourself. Um, this is just the S curve. Basically says you don't ever get comfortable when you've mastered a skill. Like always get yourself into a learning mode and a conscious competence mode. Um, and if you are always operating in that mode, the return for you, either as an individual, is you've got six times higher the chance of success, and as a business, you've got 20 times greater the chance of making more money than everybody else. And so that's where you see some of the biggest disrupt <coughs> excuse me, the disrupted players playing. And I'll come back to um, to a few examples of that. So this is a this is a really really big theme. I've ne you know in my business career, I've never stayed in a role where I felt comfortable. It's always, what do I need to do next? What do I need to do next? What do I need to learn next? How do I keep shoving myself out of my comfort zone um, to keep going? Um, uh, just the, uh, 
other one, let me just say, let's just go back to that, just a couple of other things on this one. Um, I think it's really important, in, particularly if you're in business or, or government or university, because governments, by the way, are not immune to any of this stuff coming. <laughs> we are completely wide open and vulnerable to all of these changes coming. It's really important that you do take considered risks, so it's just like you've got to be a little bit careful around what you just go and chase. Um, it is important to be considered in that. Um, and I think the, the interesting one for me is Zero, having spent time in there. I was really surprised. They were about seven years in, I think. And they were already talk about, talking about replatforming their entire business. So this is a company that's seven years old that is prepared to chuck the entire business platform out the window because they recognise that it was starting to become obsolete. So that's the kind of mindset um, of disruption and, disruption and exponential disruption. So when we think about, okay, so what are the skills that you need, you know, have, you know in terms of operating in this new world? Uh, and there's obviously the foundation skills that, you know, many of us have. Um, the interesting one um, that's starting to come through in a lot of the demands for leaders uh, is not just um, diversity, but is cultural diversity. Uh, so it's not just gender, it's actually, it's, it's much broader than that. And I think, you know, Auckland has such an incredible opportunity here. But the work that's been done by Mei Chen and some of the work that we did at Zero just shows we aren't tapping into that at all as a, um, as a uh, city. The second one is the competencies in terms of how we approach things. So we are shifting big time. So as our jobs get automated, and around 40 to 45% of jobs in New Zealand are at risk of automation over the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, so personally, that rips my heart out to know that for some companies, or, and for some companies, half of their workforce are gonna go. For my company, probably 10 to 15, maybe 20% will go. And I feel an immense responsibility to help those people understand, actually, do you know what? Your job is looking like it will go. I don't know exactly when, but let's start to prepare you for transitioning to jobs that will be around um, as we go through this change. And so what kind of skills do we need? We need critical problem solving because the, comp the artificial intelligence, machine learning, that will do a lot of the basic repetitive stuff for us. We need to be really creative. We need to be exceptionally strong communicators and we need to collaborate. The other one that's not in there but that I will talk about is the importance of emotional intelligence and we'll come back to that. Uh, and then character qualities, which is another big part in terms of um, a number of students often ask me, what do you hire for? And I say I hire for attitude, way over your skills, and I hire for diversity. So if you've done a wider range of things, uh, then I'm li more likely to hire you. So the old traditional models of hiring um, are starting to break down. So there's a whole range of stuff in there in regards to skills that are, that are going to help us get through the next um, decade or so. So I thought um, we'd just talk about some of the obstacles. So that's leading for change. Understand the context. Understand where you're going. Um, talk the language of people who are at different stages in this, because we don't have one um, language and one experience around this. Society is very broad. Um, and get yourself out of your comfort zone over, 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 and over again. So what are some of the obstacles? And I love this quote, because this is a bit how I thought in my early 20s. Like, all I need to do is just ignore, you know, like mum said, you know, you can't have a baby and go back to work. And I'm like, you know, I can. No, I can. I can do that. Um, you can't have a nanny. No, I can have a nanny. Um, and because, you know, that was horrific. Like, one, she was so excited I was pregnant and having a child. She was going to be a, grand a grandma. Um, and also I was pregnant out of marriage, which was just really seriously bad in my family. Um, but then the two, the thought of me going back to work from my parents' perspective was absolutely not. Um, then all I need to do is be ambitious. That's natural. Sit at the table. Mm -mm, sometimes. Work hard. Yep, that's natural. And it's smooth sailing all the way. So what could possibly go wrong? Uh, and as I've learned through my career, a lot goes wrong. <laughs> and the first one, actually, that's been probably one of my biggest realisations through my career is it starts with me, actually. It's not about blaming everyone else, it's about me. And as I went through the Global Women Program, um, which is where, I think I met Trudy, um, what I, th this quote was put up in front of me and it was actually life-changing. And I just fundamentally agree with it. I, I don't think um, all of our younger generation feel like this, but I know a lot of people feel like this. So our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It's our light, not our dark, that actually most frightens us. And we ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented and fabulous? And actually the question should be, who are you not to be that. And so a lot of the work that I do with my teams is about getting them into this space, is about making success 
wonderful about understanding where their potential, their capability is, and um, not being afraid to go and achieve that and attack that and shine in that, but to actually want to go and chase that uh, and make that really important. A lot of it is around internal voices that just sit there on, the, on our shoulders. Uh, and a big one for women over and over again is we just lack confidence. So in terms of diversity in your teams, how you can bring confidence out, particularly in terms of women, uh, in terms of cultures, and in terms of LGBT. Um, so that, that's a big part of what I focused on in my role at Zero was an incredibly diverse team and improving the confidence of every member of the team, particularly the ones who tend to be less confident. The second one is attitude, so just on the right-hand side. Um, Open-mindedness and diversity go together. And what I often observe, um, let me put it another way, I fundamentally believe, um, someone once said that great leaders have the ability to hold multiple opposing views in their head for long enough to gather enough information, enough insight, enough facts, enough qualitative information to make the best decision. And what I observe happening in society is that we don't do that. Actually, we're shutting down um, conversations, uh, partic particularly in the political arena. We're just firing arrows at each other rather than holding conversations open and saying, well, you know, interesting, you could be right. We punish our politicians for changing their minds. That's a flipping good thing, <laughs> that they actually were open-minded to get new information to say, I've got to change. So for me, that's a really big part of leadership, is being able to understand to not just have the people around me, but be able to hold their views enough. So diversity brings that. Uh, and what's really important with that is emotional intelligence, so we'll come back to that. The other one that's coming through really, really strongly, uh, and I'm noticing big time, not just in the political space, um, is social entrepreneurism and, um, and social impact of businesses, and so things like Impossible Foods. So this scientist in um, Stanford stood in front of the room of ag tech people, no wonder they're a bit pissed off, and said, I'm going to eliminate animal meat by 2025. Because that's the right thing for the planet. Because it uses less water, less land, and he just listed off, you know, the amount of protein you can get per acre out of um, beef is 20 grams. The amount of protein you can get per acre out of plant-based food is 200 grams. <coughs> now, like, hello. <laughs> that's a pretty compelling proposition for the environment and socially. So, we, you know, we're definitely seeing a big part of this rising, which I think is super exciting. And I actually believe, as our job losses go through, that what we'll start to see is people will contract for one, two, three organisations, and do a lot of social-based community work uh, as well. And I think that's a really exciting model. Um, uh, you know, the thing about diversity, though, is that we ain't embracing it. <laughs> so if NASA launched a person into space today, she could soar past Mars, travel all the way to Pluto, Pluto return to Earth 10 times before we'll have equality in the boardroom around the C-suite. And, you know, that's just far too flippin' long. <laughs> uh, we, and, and that's just for women, let alone cultural diversity, um, you know, accessibility, diversity, and all other forms. So we're not moving on this fast enough, um, I guess is my message here. Uh, the next one is just the value of lifelong learning. So, uh, you know, that's, that's what I've really learned. I think, Trudy, you talked about that a little bit. Um, is, is it Debbie who's doing the mindfulness? Yes, we were talking about who's Debbie's just come out of corporate. Um, set up our own business, went th put herself through education to set herself up for that. That's exactly what we need to be doing. I think in my lifetime, I'll have three to four different careers. Um, I was on a path to one because that's what my dad did. Um, and kind of, a, you know, I've opened my life up. Um, and dad wasn't wrong. That was just what they, that's just what he did. I'll have three to four and my kids will probably have seven to eight different careers. And what I've learned is that, um, linked into the confidence, that you create a whole lot of skills as you go through and do different things, and that skill set is equally applicable as you go through. So just having the confidence to know that you can step out and do something quite different, and all of the skills that you've accumulated are entirely relevant and useful for that. And you're just going to go and chuck another 10 skills in your skill set from this completely different thing that you've got. So that whole attitude to lifelong learning is, I think, one of the biggest things that our country can start to talk about and encourage, uh, is how you do that. And if you don't have that, you won't get through the next 20 years um, in terms of um, careers and businesses. Next one for me is around the tall poppy syndrome. Uh, so I think New Zealand has two major obstacles to navigating this next decade and to success on the world stage. One is we 
um, uh, uh, let me articulate it this way. So in America, someone described, if you have a failure in America, it's a scar. You just scarred. If you have a failure in New Zealand, like you're chopped down. <laughs> like that's it. Um, and it's really hard to come back from that. And that's wrong. So our fear of failure we need to turn into, that is the place where you learn the most. And your ability to take that and learn from it and build something greater is where the magic happens. And so this is just a good example. I just remember before going into the last Rugby World Cup, these were the headlines, the first two. Carter has none of that old all black magic. It was like, for fuck's sake. <laughs> Did you see that man on the field in the finals? <laughs> Um, and the second one is, you know, is Richie McCaw a spent force? Well, I think we all learnt that he wasn't. Um, <laughs> and, you know, the great thing that I think is, um, you know, Richie lost the World Cup. He won two straight after that. We lost the America's Cup. We came back in a way with vengeance that we just built something that could not be beaten. And while the country's going, oh, we're 6-1 up and, oh, my gosh, are we going to make it? Those boys didn't give a toss. They knew they had developed technology, teamwork in ways that they couldn't be beaten. So for me, it's about time we stood up as a country and said failure is okay, learn from it, because we've got some incredible examples of, let's start with sports people, who have done that and gone on to achieve more. So I think the whole, the whole um, there's some interesting thinking going around at the moment around hashtag RIP tall poppy. I'm so in for that. Um, because we've got to get over that, and we've got to get, a, got, get, got to get over our fear of creating great success on the world stage. We've got to lift the ambition of our country. So I think that's a really major obstacle for us moving forwards through the next decade or so. So the last one is creating loyal and winning teams, and then I'm going to kind of wrap up and open up to questions, so hopefully you've got some. Um, so for me, there's basically three things to it. It's the head, the hand, and the heart. So it's the what are you doing, it's the how do you do it, and the why you do it. And when you put those three things together, then you can create some incredible teams. Um, obviously having the context of where the world's going and helping people understand why change is important um, is, is super important to success. So let's just go a little bit through that. The big change in the head, which is basically your strategy, your goals, that's, that's basically the head, um, is that we're shifting business models entirely. And for me, this is not just an application to business, this equally applies to government. So what I observe, you know, in the, um, oh, someone's smiling there. <laughs> oh, this way? Oh, got you, okay, go this way. So what I observe in the um, government space is this platform play is equally appropriate. So yeah, Callaghan, NZTE, NZVIF, MPI, we need to start working as a platform for innovation for New Zealand, rather than individual companies around it. Is it still doing funny things? No good? Okay, I'll just stand over here. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, so Zero is a great example of a platform play. Not good? This way? <laughs> here? About here? Okay. Um, Zero, I'm, I'm good with feedback, you just keep giving it to me. Um, Zero is a great example of a platform play. Um, so they've created a whole ecosystem around them. Why did they do that? Because it takes work out of it for customers um, and because it's incredibly sticky. You know, once you're on that platform, it becomes really, really hard to leave it. And um, the other big shift that we are seeing in kind of the strategy is the shared assets. So exponential thinking is about abundance. Our thinking of incremental innovation is about how do I do more with what I've got? But Airbnb and Uber are some of the greatest examples of exponential abundant thinking. They were not constrained by the resources they had. They just said, right, we're going to go and get as many homes as we can, as many other people's cars as we can. And so that's the difference um, between incremental innovation and exponential. And so I'd be really encouraging you to think about how do you take an abundant mindset? You don't have to own the resources. How do you tap into those resources in a win-win way? So that's some of the big shifts um, in regards to the head part of it. The hand um, is very much, well, how do you get this done? In amazing tools, many of students here would have been exposed, hopefully there's a few, exposed to um, agile design thinking, lean processes. All of that leads to thinking about business uh, in terms of the how you take your stuff to market. And that will fundamentally shift. It will shift you into the space of customer experience, um, you know, user experience, all of that stuff. So some amazing tools there uh, to use. And then the last one, oh, actually the second, um, second one around the how, for me is emotional intelligence. So kind of in my late 20s, early 30s, I started to realise that I was 
you know, wonderfully ambitious and, you know, had some good skills and that got me promoted. And then suddenly I hit this wall and it was because I started managing teams with layers in it. And so my individual functional skill set was no longer what made the success as a team. So emotional intelligence, which is the ability to manage your emotions, to create relationships, uh, it equates to, in this study, 58%, in other studies, up to 80% of your success in your job. Uh, and so being able to tap into emotional intelligence, which the great news is, when I started my emotional intelligence journey and I got measured, it wasn't flash, it wasn't great, you wouldn't call that success. And you know, seven, eight years later, you know, I'd built my skills and I was at the, you know, heading towards the top of the, the emotional intelligence benchmarks. You can learn this shit. <laughs> you don't have to, you know, you don't have to be born with it, you can learn it. Um, but it is fundamental to unlocking um, some of the potential. The rest of it, of course, is about your IQ uh, and about your skill set. But the biggest part of what we do is about our emotional intelligence. And when you're working with diversity, when you're being open-minded, you need to control your emotions. <laughs> uh, and then the last one is the heart. This, for me, is actually the most important. Uh, and I've been blessed to work in organisations that are purpose and values-led. And people, will, people want to follow something bigger, a bigger cause. It's not just about the money. Uh, and so I chair a social enterprise called Figure New Zealand. We're about democratising New Zealand's data. That's an incredible purpose. Uh, we have, over the last year, increased our revenue by 300%. The year before, it was by 1,000%. And we're all, we're social enterprise, so we're all externally funded. So people's um, wanting to buy into the purpose of what we're doing, there is another great example, which is purpose and values led. So that is the, the heart side of it. So when you get those three together, that's where you create the opportunities to create teams that can lead through change. Um, so the last one I just thought I put up is just the Callahan Innovation, because I probably should talk about Callahan somewhere. Um, and this is the leadership framework that we follow, which is very much around, you've got to know yourself, so that's all around emotional intelligence, your strengths, your weaknesses, all of that, you know, your journey, own that journey. And mindfulness, mindfulness is a really important factor, and the wonderful thing that we're seeing is that more people are owning up to the importance of mindfulness, and all these, as we talked about, closet meditators and now suddenly coming out as leaders because it's no longer embarrassing to say that you lead and you meditate because mindfulness is an important part to manage your energy, to manage your power, to manage change in the world. And then it's about showing people the future. Uh, the next one for us is about how you take your team on the journey for that. Uh, and the last one is, is actually about delivering. So you're delivering what you're promising. So that's just an example. And we're about to roll this out um, very quickly. Hopefully my team's seen it. Actually, have you seen it yet? No, there you go, they haven't seen it yet. Uh, transparency and, honest, and openness is another factor of mine. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, right, so I think um, I just can't, I'm going to kind of leave this up here. So in terms of what I think are some of the interesting attributes that we need to be charging ahead with over the next decade are very much around curious. You've got to be curious like, and have courage to question the status quo. Uh, and don't be put off by people who say no, you've got to keep going. Um, commitment to overcome the challenges, that is the message there. Compassion for other people, like just chucking grenades at each other between the young and old generation around housing, actually will never not get us anywhere. That's, it's a rubbish conversation, we need to change the conversation. Um, we need to be far more compassionate than that. Collaboration for win-win, purpose and values is an incredible place to start to create win-win sustainable partnerships. If you start your partnership with a business goal in mind, you won't get as far as if you start with a purpose for the next 20 years in mind and an agreed kind of similar way, values of how you go about achieving that. So that's the big shift we've also seen. Um, collabor um, community minded, so the whole ecosystem approach, the ecosystem around innovation in New Zealand is way too hard. It is too hard for our entrepreneurs and innovators to find their way around it. So we can talk about that in questions if people want to. Uh, and then you've got to have the communication skills to motivate. So just to kind of finish on a story, when I was 15, uh, 16, um, I kind of told my um, music teacher that I wanted to do performance piano. He kind of laughed at me because I, you know, he, I never played the piano to him. And he made me play and I did all that. And he said, right, you're playing an assembly next, next week. And I said, no, 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 I'm not playing an assembly next week. And he said, you are. So next week, sure enough, I'm turning up with my shop and piece of music. And, um, and he does this introduction where, I don't know, I had about 600 kids in the school. And he introduces me and literally, I'm on the wall 
over and I'm literally going down like this and I ended up sitting on the floor. I hated attention. I was incredibly shy. Um, I didn't want to speak in front of lots of people. I didn't want to perform music in lots of people. But here I am, 20 something years later, talking in front of all of you. And you know, so we can grow, we can develop. Um, and it's about, it's important. It's important that I am a good communicator for what I do. So I just have to bite my tongue. I've just had to learn how to do it uh, and persevere through it. So thank you so much for your time. I think we have um, plenty of time for questions now. So my experience, um, is that often it takes women a little bit longer to raise their hand up. So my um, challenge to you is feel free to put it up fast.